All right. We are now live for the July 2021 AMA. We do these monthly sessions, and you can ask me about anything that you like. Um, I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of topics that I've asked about already many, many times, like, you know, what do you think about Zizek, or what do you think about Peterson, or stuff like that, that you might want to just go back to previous AMAs, but there's plenty of other stuff going on. I've got myself a good mug of my Stone Creek coffee. Um, they're a local um, coffee producer right here in uh, Milwaukee that is, is just a few blocks from here. They have uh, a number of different locations, and they, they make some <clears throat> really good stuff. So I'm happy to have that. Got my cat snoozing off camera just um, about uh, six feet from me on the uh, bunk bed. So uh, Mark says, hey, everybody, hope you're doing well. Yeah, hope, hope everybody's doing well. Here in America, of course, it's 4th of July weekend. And since the 4th falls on a Sunday, that means a lot of people are getting off on Monday as a holiday day. So it's kind of a big thing. It's also a uh, big thing because one of our local sports teams is in the playoffs, the Bucks, who are located just um, about four blocks north of here in the Deer District. <laughs> so things are going to be quite exciting here for, for a bit. All right, so let's, let's take some uh, questions. Um, Made of Clay asks how I'm doing this week. I'm actually sick, but I'm, you know, so physically not feeling great, but I'm actually feeling psychologically pretty good. Uh, my classes are going along well. I've got a number of different projects going on. I just uh, published a uh, another piece in Stoicism Today, our, our Saturday post, about all our new team members that we've got, so that's kind of nice. Um, all right, Sam, thoughts on the works of Thomas Merton. So, I, you know, Merton is one of those people who I read early on in my studies, and I, I'll put it to you this way: I don't just like him in um, authors that I'm not as big on. I, I do respect him as as somebody who you know went through a, a intellectual conversion and embraced the monastic life and really did try to figure out what was going on in the works and thoughts and lives of other people. So that's admirable. But I, I, don't, I just don't get into him too much. And I've known a lot of people who really enjoy his work. Um, so there's, there's got to be something that grips people there, but I'm, I'm just not one of them. Mark asks, do you think being a good judge of character is important to virtue ethics? How could a person develop such a capacity? So, yeah. Um, that is important. I think a lot of people, when they approach virtue ethics, they approach it in the wrong frame of mind where they're like, okay, it's a, what are the rules? How do I become the, the good person, the ideal, you know, whether it be Aristotelian or Stoic or Neo-Confucian or pick whatever you want, right? Um, and it, it really is much more, virtue ethics understood properly is much more about making sense of who you are as the screwed up person by the time that you start to study it, um, figuring out how to understand and improve your relationships, how to make progress towards greater and greater amounts of virtue and figure out what vices you've got in the background that are messing you up and you know probably messing other people up as well. <clears throat> so becoming a good judge of character, which is not a, you know, not a science at all, that is more of a uh, set of techniques and insights that you you kind of cobble together. You can rely on other people to some degree, but you're still the person who has to make the judgments. Um, that can be you know quite difficult to develop. I think that part of the way you do that is experimentally, right? And part partly also through dialogue with other people. You say, what do you think of so-and-so? Oh, well, I think they're good. And then there should be like in this respect, but maybe not in this respect or something like that. Uh, first name, last name, are, am I a vegan? I am not a vegan. Why or why not? Because I'm not a vegan. You know, the default for me is not being a vegan. The default for me would be, uh, 
you know, being basically an omnivore who tries to eat as ethically as I can, um, there, there are all sorts of problems associated with, you know, uh, in terms of ethics uh, associated with vegetarianism or veganism, um, you know, farming uh, is, is pretty resource intensive, kills lots and lots of other animals and um, microbes and, and things like that. So it's not as if any, any lifestyle is, is cruelty free or anything like that. Um, I think it's, it's better not to think in terms of being a vegan, but in terms of being, you know, more plant-based and thinking about, you know, in terms of eating meat, ethical farming, um, I think the, the ways to go. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with like lab produced meats uh, and other things as well. Um, yeah. All right, uh, Jose Alberto, do you think empiricism is the superior form of a, a, attaining knowledge? So empiricism is not a form of a, attaining knowledge, experience, would be a form of attaining knowledge. And empiricism says that experience is very important. But, um, you know, empiricism comes in a lot of different varieties. William James very famously criticizes in his form of what he calls radical empiricism. He criticizes the empiricists of his time for not being empiricist enough. It's very easy to become a rationalist empiricist and this is what i would say that the people who are like you know fuck yeah science you know get into quite easily they think oh yeah we're like just looking at the facts man just looking at the world just experience and um you don't have experience that isn't filtered through all sorts of uh you know socio-cultural uh matrices there there's no such thing as like pure pure experience um it's always going to be interpreted and so a lot of the traditional empiricist projects have been shown, you know, if we thought, thought them through, they, 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 they need something else in order to make them work. And the people who are devoted to like, you know, a certain kind of empiricism, you know, uh, think about, you know, um, the, the emphasis on the positive sciences in the, the 19th and 20th century in positivism of different sorts. Um, those are, you know, they leave so much out that that can be problematic. So is, is uh, empiricism as a general attitude a, a better way of guaranteeing that one is going to attain knowledge? Depends on what you're trying to gain knowledge about. I mean, there's some things where you actually do have to, like, you know, put the, 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 the food in your mouth and see how it tastes, right? Or um, try something out and, and experience it. And then there's a lot of things where that's not the one mode to do things with. Um, made of clay, I'm becoming more aware of the position that Hegel either does or doesn't reject a law of non-contradiction or that contradiction can or can't be subdued. I'm wondering what you think. Well, I, I don't know that there's a position that Hegel either does or doesn't reject the law of non-contradiction. Those would seem to be two different positions, right? The position that he does, the position that he doesn't. And then it depends on how you understand the law of non-contradiction. Um, there's different ways of formulating it. It's not always the same thing. And we want to think about the nature of contradiction. Is contradiction the same thing as opposition? Or is contradiction merely one type of, of opposition? You know, think about Aristotle's categories, right? Um, there's different ways of opposing things to each other. Um, I don't, I don't see these sorts of things about like, what does Hegel per se think to be particularly helpful? I, I would say that what you can say is that if, if the law of non-contradiction is supposed to be an absolute law that governs every single thing, yeah, Hegel's rejecting that. How is he rejecting it? Is he just saying, well, it doesn't hold, or is he providing something else much more sophisticated in its place? I'd say he's doing that, as are other dialectical philosophers like, say, Maurice Blondel in proposing a logic of, uh, you know, lived existence or of the moral life, uh, as are other people, you know, for example, those working in semiotics um, who are approaching contradiction as well. Um, Infinite Loop says, as an artist, I'm interested in your view of separating the artist from their art. The way some people will discount a person's artwork because of their politics is interesting. 
Um, I don't I don't know too much about people being discounted because of their politics. Um, I suspect if there's any you know recent cause celebs, they're probably more the exception than than the the rule. Um, so maybe you have some people in mind, but I I don't you know I don't hear about that happening all that often. Um, Rejection, criticizing, not exactly the same thing. Um, you know, are, are there artworks not being shown in galleries because of their politics? Um, are they having people say mean things about them on Twitter? These are, these are quite different things. Um, can we separate an artist from their art? In general, yeah. I mean, otherwise we couldn't look at any, you know, Van Gogh paintings because he's dead. <laughs> Obviously, they're they're separable, right? Um, or you know, uh, can we do that with music? You know, Ronnie James Dio has been dead for more than ten years now, and yet I can listen to his music, and we can have you know discussions about you know is Holy Diver the best of the albums or or not or things like that. So obviously, yeah, we we can separate artists from art, and artists themselves often separate themselves from their art. Um, that said, it sure does help to know something about the artist in order to make sense of the art. For example, Edward Munch is the scream, right? Um, is it is it the character who's who's got their you know their, their hands up there who's screaming? No, it's the scream of nature, and the person is responding in anxiety to that scream. There's no actual you know person screaming in it. Um, how do we know this? Because Munch himself said that about the work, right? And when we know that he's also responding in some respect to Søren Kierkegaard um, in his work, now that makes it even richer. So, you know, the art and the artist, they are connected, um, but they are, of course, separable from each other. I think, you know, the question of people's politics is only one of myriad ways we can go from the connection between artists and artists. All right. Um, Colum was every question and subsequently every answer thought to aim at some end. Subsequently, the appeasement of strangers on the internet has been declared to be the good at which all AMAs aim. So this is kind of parodying Aristotle. Even Aristotle doesn't think that there's any one single identifiable Thing like that that would be the good that all things aim at it the, the good that all things aim at is the good and then in the case of human beings it's happiness right eudaimonia it's not going to be something quite so simple as appeasement of strangers on the internet but um yeah i mean we could ask actually what's the what's the teleology of things like this is it to for me to like, you know, see how many questions I can answer in turn and like knock them out, like crossing things off? Or is it to promote um, dialogue? Is it to produce, uh, I mean, YouTube thinks of it mainly in terms of metrics, right? How many people are going to watch this? How many eyeballs? How much ads can we sell, right? That's a set of, of ends as well. Um, you know, what's what's the point of doing these AMAs? Sometimes the point could be, something that got established in the past and we, we stopped thinking about it. I, I originally started doing these because I said, when I reach a certain level of Patreon support, I'll do AMAs because people like AMAs, you know. All right, nominous, are numbers discovered or invented? How about both? I mean, discovery and an invention are, are kind of hand in hand. Um, inventio means both of those things at the same time. Um, infinite loop. Do you believe in moral relativism? Tell me what you think believe means in that case. Do I believe that some people are relativists? Sure. Do I believe in the sense of do I, am I an adherent, an advocate of moral relativism? Obviously not, right? All you have to do is like look at my many uh, writings and you'll see that I'm not a relativist. Um, all right. Uh, C, C. Chomp. 664, what's your experience with Franz Fanon in your work and career? I was delighted when I saw you starting to make some videos about him. So, you know, when I teach existentialism, um, he is one of the many figures that I include within the existentialist pantheon. I also think that he's um, he's got some really interesting 
things to say about the nature of understanding race and history, colonialism, um, and the need to recognize diverse points of view um, so that, you know, the experience of, uh, you know, uh, African descendants in the Caribbean is not exactly the same thing as colonized Africans in Africa, not exactly the same thing as, um, you know, descendants of slaves in Brazil or in uh, the United States of America. And we shouldn't try to like confuse all these, but we do need to recognize that the black white dichotomy, which is, you know, historically contingent, um, it could have easily have been something else instead has played this massive role in making sense out of people. And what I really like about Fanon is he doesn't have simple solutions and he, he's somebody who tried to live through simple solutions. So for example, the like, you know, all the civilization came from Africa kind of thing. He tried that out for a while and then he found out that that was bullshit and didn't help him one bit. Um, and then he's like, well, we, we should have, you know, more recognition that Timbuktu was an important place, but that's not going to help me in my situation right now. And so I think he provides us with a number of quite helpful, even though his writings are, you know, um, in some respects quite dated, right? Um, they're actually quite contemporary as well. So I, I really like Fanon. I wish he had lived longer and written more. Um, and I'm glad that I, I ran into him. Uh, the main way in which I did, I'll actually tell you a little backstory, was when I was at Fayetteville State University, which is a historically black university in North Carolina, um, we hosted the Philosophy Born of Struggle conference, which is um, you know, a sort of radical philosophy conference, particularly centered around Africana philosophy. So um, you know, both African and you know, Afro-Caribbean and African-American uh, roots. And I actually presented something on, on Martin Luther King, love and virtue ethics. And there was a lot of discussion of Fanon there at the time. And I hadn't read him and I was like, maybe I need to read this guy. So I, I did. And I was, I was quite pleasantly surprised. Um, like with many figures, you know, who, especially those who I'm teaching, I get around to shooting videos when I can. I'm actually going to be shooting some more fun on because I'm teaching him again this summer in my intro to philosophy class. Um, and I didn't, I didn't shoot everything that I wanted to on black skin, white masks. So I need to get some more core concept videos done. Um, but I, I see him as a, a really interesting, thoughtful figure who can be quite helpful. All right. Uh, my, is how relevant Dostoevsky's works in today's time? Any similar authors come to mind? Um, I think his works are, you know, to some degree relevant. Um, Notes from the Underground, I think, is very fresh and useful. Um, you know, some things in his works that are very rush independent and, um, you know, like the endless patronymics, right? <laughs> it's tough to keep track of who's who sometimes in his novels. Um, and there's, there's some things that, you know, may not speak to us as well in the present, but I think there's a lot of other things that are kind of timeless or at least concerned with us in modernity. Um, my favorite work of his remains the demons or the possessed, depending on how you translate it. I think that a lot of the discourses in it remain pretty relevant today, well worth studying. Any similar authors to Dostoevsky? Depends on um, what the, the kind of similarity that you're looking for is, doesn't it? So um, if you're asking about like authors who have characters and they're, um, you know, representing, living out, experimenting with different philosophical positions in lived ways, um, I mean, Ursula K. Le Guin, who like Dostoevsky, um, uh, you know, amongst other sci-fi slash fantasy authors, C.J. Chera, um, in her Alliance Union stuff, I would say, um, you know, Philip K. Dick, of course. Um, you know, in terms of, like, exploring dark human um, drives and stuff like that, 
and now it's it's centered more around a single character and his point of view. But Raymond Chandler, who I've been reading lately, could could um, figure into that. You know. Um, all right, it just jumped a little bit, so let me see if I can get myself back here. Um, Jeremy Glave, could you talk to me about John Dewey? Do you think his works, what do I think of his works and ideas? So I went to Southern Illinois University, Carbondale for my uh, graduate work and the Center for Dewey Studies, which has since been closed, unfortunately, due to budget cutbacks was there. And I actually worked for them for a semester um, doing, doing research work in the, uh, the library. Um, I'm not a big fan of Dewey in part because I, you know, I got an, I got so much of Dewey at Southern Illinois. It's sort of like uh, you get you get sick of certain dishes if you eat them too much, particularly when they're kind of bland compared to the the other dishes in the genre. I mean, when it comes to pragmatists, I'd much rather read um, James and Purse and Royce. Uh, Dewey's kind of a messy, muddy writer. Um, he's kind of like an American Hegel in that respect, but. You know, with Hegel, I, I'm willing to read him because I think there's a lot of great stuff there. I don't, I don't think that Dewey is better than Purse or James or, or Royce for that matter. Um, he's been much more influential because he had such a great position and, um, you know, knew everybody and uh, had a massive effect on American education. Um, but I, I think he's, um, you know, I don't think he's a first-rate philosopher. Um, that said, there's you know there's aspects of his work that I don't don't mind rereading, and I've got a lot of friends who are you know Deweyans who are into to Dewey, um, so you know he's he's just somebody who I'm I'm not that that into. I've got quite a few of his books, but I, I I'll admit I don't crack them open very often <clears throat> unless I need to. Um, Weekly Bible Talk, thoughts on Timothy Williamson's work and knowledge first epistemology. Never heard of Tim Timothy Williamson, so I have no idea. I don't know if he's important at all. Dan, dear love, what do you think about the quest for the historical Jesus? So that's like asking about what do you think about, um, you know, let's say 50 major authors, many of whom disagree with each other, wrote at different points in time and have different ideas about stuff. Um, I actually used to teach a class when I was teaching at Indiana State Prison for Ball State. Specific, it was called Jesus and the Gospel Traditions. So we would do, you know, the traditional covering the the Synoptic Gospels and, and John, and we would also talk about the nature of, um, you know, Paul's contributions. Um, interestingly enough, the Book of Psalms by medieval authors was considered to be like a fifth gospel. Um, so we talk about that a bit, and then we talk about the non-canonical Gospels, and I would draw on the early work of Bart Ehrman when he was, he was still a really good scholar. Um, and um, then we would talk about, you know, canon formation and, you know, what sort of – we would also talk about the quest for the historical Jesus and how some of it is just like pure fantasy projection on the part of the people engaged in it. Some of it's kind of hubristic stuff like, you know, uh, the, uh, the project where they were going to go through and like, you know, uh, redline some of the passages uh, after a vote, you know. Um, I do think that, that, you know, historical research is important, um, but it has to be, you know, properly contextualized. And I think over time in recent years, that, that has become recognized as, as the case. Um, so, you know, like, you take John Dominic, John Dominic Crossan, right? Um, some of the stuff that he asserts, you're like, okay, this really adds to the picture of things. Some of the stuff you're like, oh, man, this is just your little hobby horse that you're riding. And the trouble is, like Albert Schweitzer pointed out, about the quest for the historical Jesus, it's very often like a well where you look down, and what you see at the bottom is your own reflection. So different people turn this this figure into what they want him to be, you know. Um, and you can say the same thing, by the way, about the quest for the historical Socrates, the quest for the historical Buddha, the quest for the historical Confucius, because those exist as well. And those are also um, uh, bones of real contention. Um, the Undertaker 49, I'm currently reading Undoing Gender by Judith Butler. What are your thoughts on it? I haven't read Undoing Gender, so I don't have any thoughts on it. Um, 
Ash, what would modern would modern science develop if we kept viewing the natural world through Aristotelian teleology? Um, natural science, modern science did develop through viewing the world through Aristotelian teleology early on. <laughs> so, um, if we kept on doing it, maybe not. I mean, uh, Aristotelian teleological understanding of nature doesn't appear to have been, you know, on point. But um, you know, it doesn't mean that that human activity is not teleological. Um, so, what, what teleology do you have in mind? That's that's the question you got to ask. Michael Bruce Hill, are you familiar with the 1960s television series The Prisoner? Love to know your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, Iron Maiden has a song called The Prisoner, right? So, uh, by uh, by the time that I was 15, no, 14. I had already known that there was this cool song with, with an intro from the, the actual show. And I was asking people, and then I found out there was a British show. Obviously, it wasn't easy back then as a kid living out in the sticks with no internet, because the internet didn't exist at that time uh, in the way that we know it, to uh, get to watch it. But I've subsequently watched some of the episodes of The Prisoner. It also came up when we used to play uh, GURPS, the generic universal role-playing uh, uh, system uh, by Steve Jackson Games. There was actually like a module on The Prisoner. And so um, it's, you know, it's kind of an interesting show. Um, it's, it's quite dated. It's cheesy in many ways, but it's also kind of cool to watch. Um, I think it's now available again on Amazon Prime Video. So I, I am trying to find a time when my wife and I can both watch our way through the entire pretty short series. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting to check out. Um, hi says views on Ashavakra Gita have no views on that. Uh, DC Frank, did you lose weight? Dr. Sadler, you look thinner. I haven't lost any actual weight. Um, I'm still hovering in the two seventies, but I have been since, um, you know, the, the, the mask mandate ended here in Milwaukee. I've been able to go back to the Wisconsin Athletic Club and start doing um, weight training again. And also I go sometimes with my wife to do um, aqua zumba classes. Um, and uh, you know, I you know I haven't been doing as many walks lately, but I'm still walking around, which is good. Um, so I, don't, I haven't actually lost any weight, but I've replaced some fat with muscle. <laughs> so. <laughs> that probably makes a difference, right? Um, I'm waiting to see a point where I actually do start losing weight overall um, and hoping that it starts soon uh, because, you know, the more the more weight I can actually lose, the better it is for my old joints, my, my knees. One knee is missing two ligaments that were torn uh, almost a decade ago. The other knee has been compensating, you know, um, a 50 year old body, I got to lose some of this, this weight. So, all right, BM in the history of philosophy, when did language first become ontologized as it actually became in the 20th century? I, I don't know what you mean by ontologized. Um, so I can't really answer that effectively. Um, but I mean, language has been speculated about for a very long time, not just in the West, but also in, in, uh, you know, Chinese philosophy and Indian philosophy and other things. I mean, think about um, the very beginning of the Tao Te Ching and the reflections on whether the Tao can be talked about or think about the um, dialectical school in, in ancient China. Think about Plato's Cratylus and, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff. So I, I, I don't know what you mean by ontologizing language. That's probably from somebody's particular take on uh, history or philosophy of language. So... All right. Um, Godward podcast, Melito of Sardis. How important is this stuff, including on Pasca? Never heard of him, so I don't know. Um, Nominus, I like Bas von Frassen for contemporary empiricism. Yeah, I don't know. I, I had to read him back when I was like studying for prelims in grad school and have not picked him up since. So, um, 
SV, what's your view on the work done by Academy of Ideas YouTube Brothers on philosophy? So this is, I'll say right off the, off the bat, I, I don't know. I don't watch them, so I don't have any views on them. Maybe other people might want to weigh in. And I will say this, you know, my time is limited. I get the same 24 hours a day that everybody else gets, you know, so between um, – Teaching and classes, content production and video, podcast, blogs, uh, editing Stoicism Today, um, doing all these sort of online events, um, managing my client load, and um, trying to, you know, exercise, live a life, spend time here with, you know, my, my uh, family. Um, I don't get, I don't have unlimited time. And so I don't have any more than anybody else does. So I don't, I don't spend um, much time at all watching other people's videos. I don't even really watch my own videos, you know, unless I'm like editing them or something along those lines. Um, I'm not a good judge of that. Other people would have to be the judge of it. Those who are more consumers than, than producers. Um, similar things with podcasts. I, I listen to just a few other people's podcasts. I go on a lot of podcasts as a guest, but I don't, I don't have the time to listen to a ton of podcasts. When I'm at the gym right now, I'm actually listening to Stanislaw Lem's Star Diaries because I, I might talk about it in the upcoming worlds of speculative fiction in September on Stanislaw Lem. Um, or I might listen to the Southpaw podcast or the political theory podcast, but I, I don't listen to like a wide range of stuff because who's got the time? All right. Um, Ruffy Bumble asks an interesting question. Have you ever met a magnanimous person? I feel like the magnanimous person is rarer and even more beautiful than the wise person philosopher. So if you mean it in the, in the Aristotelian sense, um, where the person possesses all of the virtues and is a, sort of like above other people, but, you know, treats people who are close to their level with, you know, some off, being off put, but, but being kind of off putting, but people below them, the humble people as if they matter. Yeah. I have met people like that. We, we call people like that. Um, you know, there's this biblical uh, thing that comes up in, in, uh, the epistle of James, not to be a respecter of persons, right? Treat treat people in a, in a way that sort of overcomes our social status, honor, obsession. Um, Alistair McIntyre is like that. I mean, I can't say that he has every single virtue or like an Aristotelian, uh, you know, uh, gentleman, if, if th those exist, but I'd say he's a magnanimous person. Uh, my engagements with Christopher Gill, I would say he he kind of fits the bill on that, as would I would say um, some of the other people that I've I've interacted with over the years. Um, if we're understanding it in a, in a non Aristotelian sense, because it's not as if Aristotle is the only philosopher who talks about that, you know, the Stoics placed um, magnanimity uh, under the, the rubric of courage it has to do with, you know, great spiritedness or great soulness. Um, and I've met quite a few people like that too. Um, it's interesting. One thing that Aristotle says about the magnanimous person is that they, they are deserving of great honor and they, they take it or they, they, demand it but not in a way where the it's off-putting for like the people who are stuck below so if, if they're at a banquet um they're not going to be giving the serving staff a hard time as a matter of fact they might be the good tipper or they might be the person who's like hey um that person who just dropped those dishes go find out what's going on with them you know um don't like you know do the clapping thing or make fun of them or anything like that. And this is a bit of a side note. You can really tell a lot about people, how they treat the, the people who are not just like at their peer level, but people who are in subordinate um, positions to them, how they treat cleaners, how they treat servers, how they treat secretaries, all those sorts of things. Um, do they talk with, with them as if they're real people or do they treat them merely as tools for what they want? 
I think that's part of um, being a magnanimous person. It's not, you know, rising above and being like, I'm the star and I'm so better than everybody else. It's, you know, when you're treating, you're, when you're dealing with your manager or the other stars or something like that, then you might have that. But when you're dealing with, you know, people who are in a much lower position, you, you actually treat them as if they're human beings. That's, that's part of it. Um, all right. Uh, Armin, what do I think of simulation argument? If you mean the argument, and there are many different arguments that are made that we are living in a simulation, I think they're kind of implausible, but um, there we'd have to talk about, well, which one do you do you want to bring up, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'll put it to you this way. I don't think there's any more reason to think that we're in a simulation than to think that we're not in a simulation. Um, it's kind of a cool set of ideas to knock around, but, you know, I just don't, I don't buy it myself. Um, Sean uh, Hamill, what do you think, if any, is a solution to the problem of God commanding the Israelites to annihilate Canaanite peoples? Do you think this makes the God of Christianity and Judaism an Im immoral God? I guess if you like lump everything that that's there, I mean, this is kind of a typical, like, atheist uh, uh, thing, if you, if you approach these things in a very simplistic way and you're like, you know, whatever God said at any time, that's what every single Christian and Jew buys into, um, then I guess you got a real problem there. If you think that there's like development or anything like that going on, or that maybe, you know, part of the, the revelation is, uh, you know, coming from God and part of it is human interpretation, I don't know, that's not that big of a problem then, right? Then you can say maybe that was the wrong thing to do from the you know a perspective even internal to to the uh, biblical texts, you know. Um, so I, I don't see that as a, a real problem. Um, made of clay, one time my philosophy professor told us that math cannot get at a, a objective reality. And he gave us an example by adding one droplet of water to another and having it equal one drop of water. Thoughts? Well, I mean, if what you're counting is drops of water, then you've got, you know, an interesting mathematics there where one plus one equals one. If you're similarly using mathematics and talking about the volume of water, you've added a certain volume to another volume, and now you've got a larger volume. Not a real problem, right? And this is sort of a, a silly trick that, that people use. Um, I mean, mathematics is very useful for getting at a lot of aspects of reality that we consider to be objective in you know, whatever sense objective is going to mean. Oftentimes, objective means something like, um, you know, it's the same for you as it is for me as it would be for somebody else coming in the room. And mathematics is really great for that sort of thing, isn't it? Right? Because we can measure things and we can calculate and, and uh, you know, add things up and, you know, uh, maintain a certain kind of structure to things. Um, now, it's, it, there's another question. How much of reality can mathematics successfully model? That's a big question, isn't it? Some people think that mathematics is really the basis for understanding everything. And they got some real kicks in the pants in the development of mathematics in the 20th century, didn't they? With, you know, uh, you know Cantor and looking at uh, different types of infinity and Gerdel and the incompleteness uh, uh, theorem and, um, you know, the application of that later on by, uh, because Gerdel's, you know, incompleteness theorem doesn't just apply to mathematics, it applies to anything that could be modeled, any formalizable system that can be modeled as mathematics. And so, you know, Douglas Hofstadter and Gerda Lescher Bach tries to use this to talk about AI and the possibility of, um, you know, making sense out of all these other things that can be mathematized. So, um, I mean, your professor was being kind of a silly jerk with you, I think, but it's not as if mathematics is able to grasp. It's not as if mathematics can be the tool by which to grasp anything. Uh, John Ortiz, how do I stop being an asshole to people? Well, um, I, I'd have to know more about the modes of assholery that you're displaying and, and you know what the basis for you behaving in that way is. I don't think there's a simple recipe. I mean, I could I could say things like, well, anytime you're tempted to say something mean to somebody, 
think about what you're saying and maybe don't say half of them. You know, and that would cut down on it. But I don't I don't know your situation enough to be able to say much beyond, you know, that sort of thing, right? Uh, Bruno asks, uh, <clears throat> what do I think of Durkheim? I mean, Emile Durkheim, the great French uh, sociologist. Um, I think that some of the stuff that he has to say is quite interesting. Um, a lot of these early sociologists are really, I mean, they are, they are doing kind of empirical work, right? But they're also really emerging from a philosophical matrix. And so, you know, like Weber and, and um, I mean, jumping ahead a little bit, you know, Mouse and his stuff on the gift. I, I think these things can be quite insightful. Um, I'm actually a fan of, of Thorsten Veblen too, an American sociologist. Um, so, you know, some of the stuff that they have to say is, is, is quite useful. Uh, I'm not a Durkheim scholar, so I've only read bits and pieces of, of his stuff. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Alfonso Williams is here. That's good to see. Um, have I ever been called to do consulting work in a hospital or a clinic? No, because um, the way that I would probably get brought in is not as a philosophical counselor, which is not a medical intervention, right? Um, deliberately so. It's not, it's not something we bill through insurance. It's not something that goes through medical certification. I would probably get brought in as an ethicist more than anything else. And no, I haven't, I haven't been brought in by um, hospitals or clinics. Um, as a matter of fact, the sort of applied ethics stuff that I do, you know, I'm not, I, I, I can say that I'm a specialist in business ethics and organizational ethics. Um, I'm not an expert in medical ethics. You know, I've taught uh, content in classes, but it's not like an area of my specialization. So they'd be better off bringing in somebody who actually does that like full time than bringing in me. Um, Thus spoke films. Are you interested in the Egyptian philosophers, Pahotep, uh, Ipawar, and uh, Ikhanata? And there seems to be very few discussion of them from small YouTube channels, and they seem to have invented monotheism. Yeah, invented monotheism, debatable. Uh, you could say um, came up with something that seems to be henotheistic or, you know, um, you know something along those lines. Are they really philosophers? Yeah, I mean, more rule, you know, um, Ikhanaton is much more a ruler than a philosopher as such, but we could call him a philosopher. Um, we don't have an awful lot on them. Um, and, you know, it's, there's probably some, some interesting work that could be done, but I, I don't engage with them very much. Um, so, you know, am I, and, I, and am I likely to? I mean, given the thousands of people I could be focusing on, um, probably not. I'll tell you who is kind of uh, impressed by, by uh, um, Ikhanaton was Philip K. Dick. So, I mean, you might want to read some of his stuff where he's talking about him, although it's going to be kind of, you know, weird, wacky things, all these interesting connections being made. Um, James Dufflinger, are you religious? If not, would you consider converting to any particular religion? If I wasn't religious at this point, would I consider converting to any particular religion? Probably not, because by the time that you get to be 50 years old, having taught philosophy, having taught religious studies classes, having like published articles in the, you know, philosophy of religion, having translated an entire, you know, set of documents that went into my, my first book about the Christian philosophy debates, if I hadn't decided by then, I probably would not. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm religious. Um, you know, I was raised uh, Catholic in a sort of nominal way because catechesis was, was garbage back in the 70s. It's pretty garbage today as well in many places. And uh, by the time I was 16, had left the church and then came back through studying um, Christian philosophers, uh, you know, originally just to work on my Latin and then, you know, um, came back uh, and finally got confirmed in uh, around 28. And then, you know, it's been kind of an ongoing relationship. I'm not particularly impressed with the institutional church uh, or, you know, uh, here in the United States with the bishops who seem to be pretty crap. 
Um, and, you know, we have never ending revelations of all sorts of abuse ranging from sexual to financial to things like that. But, you know, when you know church history, you know that the church has always been a mess. And when you know uh, sort of world religion uh, history, you know that every religious organization is similarly a mess. <laughs> Pick Buddhism and you look at particular monasteries or developments, there's all sorts of messes there as well. Um, I think that religion is something well worth engaging with and studying. Um, and then people kind of have to decide, you know, how it fits into their life, you know. Um, Proham, so many young people feel hopeless due to climate change. How can, how can we hope to help the world when it already seems too late? Well, I mean, too late in what respect? I mean, do we really know for sure that it's too late, you know, so that we're justified in saying, oh, woe is me, it's all crap. Um, maybe, maybe not, you know, um, we're going to figure out, we're a pretty adaptable species. We're going to figure out how to survive things unless we really bring things to the point where, where we can't make it. Um, you know, uh, we, we do need to start thinking long-term like this area here in Wisconsin, we're actually going to have, um, you know, milder winters and it's, it is going to get warmer here, but we're going to have longer growing seasons. Um, it's, you know, places like California and Texas and Louisiana and Florida that are going to be really screwed. And we're going to have to figure out what to do with those people. But, you know, simply having like one big thing of, oh, climate change is happening. True. Uh, a lot of bad things are on the horizon. True. And then like jumping to screw it, it's all doomed. That's, you got to look at that inference. Um, that's kind of a, a unwarranted thing to, to, to do. Um, you know, when I talk with young people, cause I teach young people, um, they're less often feeling hopeless because of climate change. And they're more often here in America feeling hopeless because the American dream turned out to be, um, sold out, especially by the generations above us, you know, the, the boomers, for example, um, who made a lot of, you know, foolish, careless decisions, and we're bad stewards of the political and economic capital that we, we built up. Um, it's been getting worse generation after generation after generation. You know, the uh, old uh, agreement that if you go to college, you'll have a job waiting for you. That wasn't even true for my generation, Generation X, uh, many of whom graduated, you know, forty to $50,000 in, in, in student loan debt, um, which would be the equivalent now, I suppose, of about, uh, you know, Hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of student loan debt. Um, the current generation really feels like the social contract has become unraveled, and that doesn't have anything to do with climate change. That's a separate issue, right? So you know, and they, and they look at what's going on in terms of voter suppression and you know gerrymandering and just trying to hold on to power and the inability to bring defective institutions and corrupt individuals to any sort of justice. And they're like, man, this is bullshit. You know, what are we supposed to do? So, you know, we've got lots of crises going on at the same time. Um, I don't know that it's too late, you know. Hi, says anything about Bhavagad Gita or Indian ancient philosophy? I don't know what you mean by anything about it. Um, I mean, I've taught the Bhavagad Gita in my classes, but I'm not a specialist in Indian philosophy. Um, it's just an area that I know something about and may talk about in some classes. I, I have helped people prep for the Indian civil service exam, which involves, you know, um, some discussion of Katila and, you know, more recent stuff as well. But what, what are you looking for? You, you gotta, you gotta tell me what you're, you're asking here. Jake, what do I think of Shakespeare and philosophy, like his idea in relation to philosophy of his time? Um, I mean, Shakespeare, uh, there's a lot of, you could call it raw material for, for using his texts to talk about philosophical topics, particularly like, you know, those that have to do with the human condition, love, jealousy, war, uh, conflict, um, all of those sorts of matters. Is he a philosopher as such? I mean, if he is, then Dostoevsky is, then Borges is, then Le Guin is, right? And then we have to extend philosopher very, very widely. Uh, Fabian, I wanted to thank you for the pep talk video. I really needed that 
I sometimes feel intimidated because I won't fully understand a text and end up not reading it at all. Okay, well, that, that, that's, that's good then, that it helped out. And I'm going to be doing more pep talk videos and more other shorts like that, talking about things germane to philosophy. Like, you know, one of the topics I want to talk about is this sense that, like, you have to read it all or you don't know anything. And that's just bullshit, you know? Um, you read what you want. It, it's your mind. It's a free country, right? As we, we used to say back back in the day. Um, Sometimes there was actually a question from Colomus a while back. Not, I don't think it was in an AMA. I think it was something else about like reading some other stuff than what the instructor was was requiring. And I was like, you know, if your if your instructor wants you to read X, then you read X, right? Uh, but you can read whatever else you want to read. You make the time for it, you know, uh, or or you don't, you know, it, it's it's up to you. You you've got, you know, like I said, everyone's got the same twenty four hours. You can spend it watching TV or listening to podcasts, or you can you can crack Plato open and read it, right? Now going back to to this uh, from Fabian, yeah, um, not fully understanding a text. You're not going to fully understand philosophical texts the first time around, or even the twentieth time around, and you're not going to understand um, literary texts, great literature. Like I, you know, I'm bringing up Ursula K. Le Guin, who I'm teaching a whole class on this this next semester at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. The Wizard of Earthsea is listed as being young adult fiction. <clears throat> it is a profound book. It's not as profound as the later Earthsea books, perhaps, but you can read it and reread that, you know, less than 200 page book hundreds of times, and you're still going to get a bit more out of it each time. That's natural. That's normal. That's, that's what makes these works classics. That's why they have survived, because people are like, well, can't just read this once and throw it away like I do the latest, you know, techno mystery novel or, you know, romance novels or stuff like that. That's why you see those books circulating in and out of used bookstores, right? The entire section. Think about romance. You read the romance novel, you get your erotic kicks from it or whatever else is going on, reading that essentially pulp stuff, and then you go and sell the book back and buy another book because you're not going to read that same book again, right? Because it's not worth reading again. Whereas you get a you know Philip K. Dick novel, and with a few exceptions where they're not particularly great, um, most of his stuff is, is pretty amazing, you get it. You'd be an idiot to, to to sell it back because you should read it again, right? So, it, it, this this is a uh, natural and and it's okay not to grasp everything uh, the first time around. If you did grasp everything, you should be totally surprised that you you did. And so, um, not reading it at all is sort of like saying, you know, that you're not going to take a job because you have no idea. Um, what you know things are going to be like at the job because you haven't worked there already for 20 years, or you're not going to um, go out on a date with somebody because you can't be completely sure that every single thing that you say is going to be a hit. You know, um, it's 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 putting too high pressure on yourself. Um, Gaussian prime, do you have any comments on Schopenhauer's treatment of Hegel? He uses some really strong language decrying him. Does this indicate deep philosophical differences? The language doesn't uh, indicate deep philosophical differences, which are there between Schopenhauer and Hegel. It, it indicates that Schopenhauer was insecure. And um, it's really something kind of, you know, people use the word cringe. It's really kind of cringy to, to read it, you know. Um, it's kind of sad that that somebody as brilliant as Schopenhauer thought he needed to go on the attack like that about Hegel. I mean, sometimes when you're reading Nietzsche on, 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 on different people, you're, you're similarly like, come on, what, what's wrong with you, you know? Just put your, put your stuff out there and uh, let it stand on its own merits. You don't have to compare yourself against this person or that person. Just, just do your thing, you know? Um, so that's my take on <laughs> Schopenhauer on Hegel. Uh, Hegel, by the way, seems to have taken zero notice, you know, of the guy who he helped out, Schopenhauer. Uh, I came that sort of stuff. I mean, Hegel had other bigger fish to fry, right? Thomas Gerard's a nice Dio shirt. Yeah, this is this is a, a present 
um, back for my 50th birthday, um, I said, you know, people could put together a list of books and under t-shirts that, that I'd like. And somebody, somebody bought this one. Um, actually, let me t I'll tell you a funny story about, so here you see the Holy Diver, right? Holy Diver is this priest who a level figure has thrown in. So when I was in high school, I um, got really into heavy metal um, at the end of eighth grade. And I was already listening to some metal bands, but then my friend Wally uh, turned me on to Iron Maiden. And then after that, it was like a summer where lots and lots of metal stuff was coming out and, and people in my neighborhood were uh, listening to other bands. And so like I got to know um, – Van Halen and and their their corpus because I'd heard like 1984 and I had that 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 tape but I started listening to the earlier stuff and um, you know listening to more ACDC than than I, I already had and and more uh, you know like listening to Judas Priest and and uh, Rat was coming out with Round and Round that summer so anyway um, I didn't really understand much about like the landscape of heavy metal I was just getting introduced to it. And I was, uh, I was going to Catholic Memorial High School, and we lived way out on the border of Delafield and Wales in uh, a subdivision called the Hills of Delafield, which is like right on the border. And um, I was going to Catholic Memorial, which is in Waukesha, so we had to carpool there. And there was another guy who was in my subdivision who, at least at that time, was going to Catholic Memorial. He was like a year ahead of me. So this would have been freshman year. And so my mom lined up the carpool and I, no, he must've been two years ahead of me because he could, he could also drive. Right. So anyway, I um, go, you know, I'd go to school with him. And then, and then like after school one day, he's like, Hey, do you want to go down to this record shop? You know, let's go check it out. And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. So we, we go down there and um, it was about like a mile walk or so. It's kind of hot. We get there. I think it was on white rock. Uh, I want to say uh, Avenue in Waukesha. If you're from the area, which most of you aren't going to be, but you know that's that's kind of an important street. So anyway, we we get in there and we're looking around, and he's this guy's obsessed with Stevie Nicks, uh, who I had never understood the obsession with, but you know everybody's got their their kicks, right? And we go. I'm over in the metal section and I'm looking at stuff, and he is like, oh. He picks up this Dio album. I've heard that this guy is like really big right now. You should um, you should check him out. So I was like, yeah, that sounds that sounds cool. I, I had no idea that Dio had been in Black Sabbath and Rainbow, and he was like, you know, he's really one of my favorite artists ever. Uh, he's a, you watch interviews with him. He's a brilliant guy. And uh, anyway, I, I'm looking at this album and albums back then cost like, you know, seven bucks or eight bucks. And I had like, you know, 10 bucks in my wallet. So I'm like, I'm going to buy this. So I buy it. And then, you know, we walk back to school, we get in his car, we drive home and um, I bring it in and I'm, I'm playing it on the, the record player. My dad had, before he died uh, about like a year, no, about two years before he died. I think he got it in 79. He bought like a state of the art, you know, setup for himself with a really great turntable and double cassette deck and a tuner and big speakers and stuff like that. And so that's what we used to play our records on. And that's what we would dub them off of. And so I put the Dio thing on there. And uh, my mom comes in and she takes one look at the record cover, you know, and she's like, What is that? And I was like, this is, this is a, you know, Dio. Um, and I'm listening to some, some of the, the first tracks. And it, it's just amazing stuff. I mean, it's, it's one of his, his best albums ever. Um, he was totally at the top of his game at the time. And she, uh, she tried to take it away from me because she's like, this is satanic. And I was like, just because there's a devil doesn't mean it's satanic. And then she's like, there's a priest in the, getting thrown in the water. Right? I was like, and I didn't have much to respond after that. And I was like, well, let's just listen to music and see if it's satanic. And, it, and it, it's actually not. But she was so mad. She, you know, because that was, you know, that was the 80s. That's when people were worried about heavy metal and Satanism. And I made the mistake of bringing home this album cover that 
that would just like almost like put it in her face. So yeah, um, kind of an interesting story there. All right, uh, John, any works that you would recommend to someone who's struggling to find a way or direction in life? Yeah, um, Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet. You don't have to be a poet to derive benefit from what he's he's saying in there. Um, and then, you know, I mean, other stuff, try to read stuff that has other discussions about how to orient one's life. Like, you know, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics book one is essentially about that. Um, you know, there's there's so many different things that you could read that might grip you and, and help you out in that respect. Um, S. Chavoshi, I'm reading Hegel and basically came to apply his master and slave dialectic. I just lost the, the thread there. Let me scroll back up. Um, to explain social and political conflicts, do you have more recommendations on the same theme? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Hegel, Hegel wrote a whole book about social and political philosophy called The Philosophy of Right. Read that, see if that applies to anything. The master-slave dialectic is a tiny, tiny bit of the phenomenology. It is not meant to explain everything going on in social and political dynamics. I know that, like, you know, it was kind of a trend with uh, thinkers in the 20th century to, to use it, but they went beyond the master-slave dialectic. Um, the master-slave dialectic is contextualized in the other parts of the phenomenology. So reading suggestions, read the rest of the phenomenology, right? But also, you know, check out Hegel's philosophy of, of right and and read his uh, um, you know uh, lectures on the uh, philosophy of history as well um, and don't try to use the master slave dialectic to explain everything because it doesn't um, that's a dead end uh, oh here's here's a current events thing what's your reaction to the discovery of unmarked graves of indigenous children of Canada and the Pope refusing to apologize for it I don't know about the Pope refusing to apologize for it so there's not not much for me to say about that um, I, that sounds like pot stirring to me uh, what's my reaction to the discovery of unmarked graves of indigenous children in Canada I think it's horrific um, and I think it also is the sort of thing that where you're like well that's not a big surprise um, the, the church and the state, um, not just in the United States, but in Canada and in other places, have been terrible to indigenous peoples and tried to destroy their cultures. Um, it's, it's a, you know, there, there are places in hell for the people who did that sort of thing, right? Um, the abuse that was, was inflicted and then being buried in unmarked graves um, you know, that's that's pretty horrible stuff. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, in his Democracy in America, he's got a section where he talks about the red and the black and the black races. And he says, America is a great place, totally screwing up when it comes to how it's managing these things. And the Canadians are not a hell of a lot different, you know, uh, when it comes to that. I can't even say that Quebecers are, are different, given how terribly they've treated, you know, people, uh, native peoples in, in Quebec, you know, uh, particularly when it came to like generating power with hydro Quebec and stuff like that. So this is not a big surprise to me. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm right now my, probably when it comes to Catholic things, my greatest uh, animosity is reserved for the bishops, not so much for the Vatican and, and the Pope per se. Um, this is the sort of thing where, if the church wanted to be the church of old, there would be a lot of people in sackcloth and ashes right now. And, and they aren't, you know? So, yeah. Uh, Bob Boberton, what's my thoughts on the plague? Albert Camus' book. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, Reread it again. I think the first time I read it was back in undergraduate maybe 1992, uh, reread it again uh, to prepare for a podcast that never happened and this summer. And um, I'm always impressed by it. And man, uh, I, I remarked on Twitter that there's certain characters' deaths who will always get me a little weepy. You know, Plato's, uh, Phaedo, Socrates' death, right? And now I'm blanking on the name of the character. Uh, 
but when he dies, the guy who's volunteering um, for all these things um, and the plague, uh, it's, it's really quite something. And, and you know, Camus is, is uh, making a lot of really interesting observations uh, through it. Um, is it my favorite work by Camus, literary work? I think it probably still is. I like it better than like the fall. Um, I mean, I'm more attracted to Camus' philosophical work, but yeah. Um, let's see, inshallah, are there any obscure philosophers or thinkers that you think are super underrated that you like? It'd be cool to see, see you do a series on forgotten or overlooked thinkers. Yeah, Lev Shestov. Uh, keep talking about him all the time. He is definitely underrated. Um, Maurice Blondel, you know, uh, another thinker I thought was worth writing my dissertation on. Um, really important person in the early 20th century. His thought actually led through a couple different streams to Vatican II, but not particularly well known um, or, or read. By the way, a great Blondel scholar and translator, Oliva Blanchette, who is uh, still at Boston College, died just last week, I think on Friday. Um, he was really, he's got a, an incredible um, intellectual biography of uh, Blondell called Maurice Blondell, A Philosophical Life, about a thousand pages long, had stuff that I didn't even know about Blondell in it when I reviewed it uh, about 10 years ago. Um, there's a lot of women philosophers who are, uh, who are not, well known in part because there's been this historical prejudice. Um, Marjorie Cavendish, you know, um, well worth reading. Um, Anna Stell, you know, um, Mary Wollstonecraft. I think many of you heard me talk about her um, quite a, quite a few times. You know, um, there's all sorts of people who are are overlooked. And yeah, I mean, where would you start? <laughs> there's so many. Um, that a series might be quite difficult to do. All right. Um, Joseph Messing, what do you think make of the various criticisms of Josson's interpretations of St. Thomas made by Alistair McIntyre, Ralph Mer McInerney, and others? Does it mishandle the commentaries on Aristotle? Does, does what? What's the it there? Um, Gilson's, does Gilson's interpretation mishandle the commentaries on Aristotle? I mean, the commentaries on Aristotle aren't really that interesting. Have you ever read them? Um, they're 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 not Thomas's best work. I'll, I'll tell you that. You know, comment, his biblical commentaries are way more interesting philosophically than than his commentaries on Aristotle, where he's sticking pretty close to the text. I mean, read the commentary on the Psalms, which of course is incomplete because he he only got up to Psalm 50, 54 when when he had his vision, and then you know shortly afterwards died. But amazing stuff, right? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't remember what, what, uh, McIntyre and McInerney's criticisms of Gilso on that are. Um, so I don't, I don't really have much more else to say about that. Uh, Colomus, any other philosophers that you feel have been more influential <clears throat> on pop culture and or literature than they have been on academic philosophy? Well, that's an interesting question. Well, John Dewey, right? Who we were talking about earlier massive influence on education and in philosophy is kind of a second tier figure, you know? Um, yeah, but who else? Um, I mean, Rene Descartes had significant influence. I mean, he's a major philosopher, but he also had significant influence throughout the culture. Um, are there other people who have been philosophers I mean, Nick Land, right, um, in recent times, kind of, you know, as I'm reading through Fang Numina, I'm kind of underwhelmed because a lot of it's just kind of, you know, typical continental stuff that we were doing in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, you know. Uh, but it's got this, like, mystique around it, and, and he's at least, like, Twitter famous and YouTube famous, I guess. Um, I don't know. Nobody else really comes to mind offhand. but. Yeah. Inshallah, are you familiar with the philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend? If so, what do you think of him? I'm familiar with him. I'm not very interested in him. I, I'm not very interested in philosophy of science per se. You know, it's not an area of my specialty, but I, you know, 
I mean, he's, he's somebody I had to read way back when, but I, I didn't. I don't remember much of what I read. Um, Ash, a Chinese person told me Chinese tend to view the state different than the West. The state viewed as an extension of the family. The symbols that make the word country mean state family thoughts. Yeah, I think you got got a line that's not really true. Um, that's it, it, sort of like tokenism. Ask a person of, of this group, what you know, how are we different from the West? You know, and you'll get whatever that person happens to think. Um, it doesn't really. There, there's a lot of things with this with the Chinese philosophy. Oh well, the symbols for this mean this. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's you know determinative of how people think about things. I mean, you may as well say, well, you know, Guo, which means country, it's got all these things in it. It's got swords in it. So the country is defended by the army. And you can be like, well, maybe at one time, but that's not really how concepts work unless you're applying this very weird philosophy of language to things. Um, I mean, I would say that there's a wide range of Chinese views on the state and there's a wide range of Western views on the state. And sometimes they connect up with each other and sometimes they don't particularly since they've been in conflict and, you know, confluence with each other for several centuries now. So I wouldn't try to do that like super generalizing. Here's the Chinese view. Here's the Western view. Um, you got to ask, well, who's Chinese view? You know, the, the view of the current uh, ruling party, uh, the view of, um, you know, Chinese people in Taiwan, the view of Chinese people in Singapore, you know, who, which, which Chinese are you talking about? You know, uh, Hitek Odadara, what are your thoughts on Jordan Peterson? I think that I've already said my thoughts on Jordan Peterson and these AMAs so many times that I probably don't need to anymore. William Zen, any thoughts on how to improve my writing skills? Reading. <laughs> Reading good literature will help you improve your writing skills because you're going to read it and that's going to have some effects on you and you're going to like see good, good stuff and then you're going to try to imitate it. And the other thing is write a lot, you know, and get people to review your writing, people who will um, not just be like jerks to you, but, you know, give you genuine constructive criticism and then take their, their, uh, their criticism to heart. Uh, Juan Pablo, what are your thoughts on the Cyril Derrida debate? Have you ever considered t series teaching Latin or Greek? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not teaching Latin or Greek because I'm not a Latin or Greek teacher. Uh, my thoughts on the Cyril Derrida debate, um, two, you know, sort of second rate philosophers that were probably, except unless we're specialists, not going to think about a hundred years in the future and not a particularly interesting, uh, debate quite frankly. It was it was cool to talk about in the 90s, but I, I don't see it as particularly important now. Um, Ash, is it possible much of the Greek philosophy from the classical era is a continuation from a philosophical tradition from the My Mycenaean era? Anything is possible. That said, that's a possibility that's probably not a probability. And it's kind of silly, downright, you know. If there was, uh, I mean, we can project any sort of tradition we want to back in time and make up any sort of like prehistory we like, but why would we do that? I mean, there's enough development going on within the long centuries of, you know, philosophical history in the greater Greek world. It's not just in Greece, by the way, too. Um, that we don't have to like make up imaginary, you know, prehistories like that. Um, there's so much development happening. So, no. Um, Jacob, are you an exclusivist when it comes to religion? I am not. So, um, and haven't been ever. Uh, Charles Bow, who's the most relevant living existentialist philosopher of our time? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know a lot of people who identify themselves as members of the existentialist movement in the way that people did back in the day. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, there's people who incorporate existentialism like I do or like Sky Cleary does, um, but I don't know of people who are viewing themselves less as like, 
you know, commentators on that tradition and, and interpreters and more as like original thinkers within that tradition. All right. Um, Daniel Stanton, do you think there are philosophical problems which the Greeks had a better handle on than contemporary thinkers? Which Greeks, which contemporary thinkers? You know, um, it's not like the Greeks are all on one one team like that stupid Monty Python sketch that everybody always wants to bring up where, you know, the Greek philosophers and the German philosophers. That was funny, like, you know, 40, 30, 40 years ago, but it's just kind of dumb now. Um, it's It doesn't work that way. So, you know, which Greeks do you have in mind? Which which contemporary thinkers do you have in mind? A lot of contemporary thinkers are actually using the Greeks. <laughs> Think about somebody like Julie, Julia Anas, right? Uh, or, uh, you know, Chris Gill or, you know, um, Alistair McIntyre, right? They're not totally divorced from them. They're contemporary thinkers, aren't they? So, yeah. Um, do, do, do. Let's see here. All right, Richa says, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on people accusing philosophers like Gadamer or McIntyre of conservatism because of their rehabilitation of tradition within rationality. Yeah, I think those people are either grifters or stupid or lazy, lazy readers because, you know, if you know much about McIntyre, you know, he was a Marxist for a while and, and you know that he's taken very explicit, clear positions saying, you know, things like you can't vote for Republicans or Democrats, you know? So, I mean, how would you possibly, other than just like doing the kind of, well, you know, they talk about tradition and tradition is conservative, so therefore they must be conservative, sloppy thinking. How do you, how do you get there? That's the only way to do it. Um, so, it's almost not worth making a, a, a response to them. It does remind me of something, though. I used to say uh, before, you know, we had these neo-traditionalists arise and kind of sully the name. Uh, I used to say I'm too traditional to be a conservative uh, because conservatives long ago quit being conservative of anything that conservatives used to be conservative of. So they're basically just kind of like playing off of the, the name. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I mean, Gadamer, you could say, is probably more conservative in some respects than McIntyre is. But if you actually like think through the implications of taking, say, Plato seriously or Hegel seriously or Aristotle seriously, you can't be a conservative in, in the in the the now you know contemporary sense. Uh, Mark says, any philosophers you would recommend for dealing with and reflecting on living with mental illness? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so this is this is where you, you, you're not going to have like one person who like would be across the board the greatest person to, to look at because it's going to be kind of – it's going to depend on you – you know, looking at what kind of mental illness you're struggling with. If you have a, a you know, a genuine um, case of, of say schizophrenia um, that without medication is going to totally disable you, that's very different than suffering from mild to moderate depression. That's very different than having, um, you know, antisocial personality disorder. These, these are all very different things. And so I think different philosophers might be helpful in different ways. Stoicism often gets a bad rap because people misunderstand the dichotomy of control. You know, and Epictetus says that some things are in our control, some things are not in our control. Um, they they read the first, like, you know, chapter of the Enchiridion and the first chapter of the Discourses, and they don't read the rest of the stuff that he says about that. Um, we can have all sorts of intrusive thoughts that we, we don't actually strictly have control over, but we can choose how we deal with them. And what what we do in in situations, and likewise the understanding of how habits and those complexes lead to the way in which we we think things out, um, stoicism can be very helpful for that. As can reading Plutarch, you know, a, ne a, a middle Platonist. Um, as can you know all sorts of other uh, thinkers as well. But it really depends on what sort of you know what sort of illness disorder capacity we're talking about. And it also, we also need to have to think about is, is, um, is it 
stuff within us or traumas that we've encountered that are making us have a rough time or is it genuine stuff out there in the world that we're needing to process better? Um, you know, um, depression, for example, can be partly biological, partly a matter of what we do in terms of our habits and partly dealing with shitty, crappy, screwed up social structures and disconnection from, from other people um, produced by um, circumstances that are outside of our control, you know? So, all right, uh, inshallah, do you know of any good Christian responses to Nietzsche? Yeah, Mark Shaler. Um, he's got a great book on Rosantamont where he's taking up that, that concept. Ridicule, Alice Huxley or George Orwell? Um, why would I have to pick either one? Um, what, are we, what, are, what are we picking about? Um, Anastasia, can a nihilist live a fulfilling life or do you f personally find that philosophical position always diminishing the person? It's probably always going to diminish the person to some degree. It's going to cut them off from taking certain risks and trusting at certain times and having certain experiences. Uh, it depends on what we mean by fulfilling. Um, and it depends on what kind of nihilist we're, we're talking about. But I think, I think you could uh, uh, definitely um, have some sort of fulfilling life, better or worse, right? Uh, Wowman, are there any virtue ethicists or philosophers who talk about self-loathing and how it affects the way we view ourselves and others? I mean, Pascal, for one, right? Um, David Hume, um, all sorts of people have talked about whatever you – mean by self-loathing, a, a negative attitude towards oneself. Um, there's, there's all sorts of people who have talked about that and um, how, it, how it would affect us. Um, all right, Wise Coyote, do I think democratizing workplaces is an effective way of tackling income inequality? No, because it doesn't have anything to do with income, does it? democratizing workplaces has to do basically with who's in charge and how things get done, but you can still have people getting paid very little and you can still have the owners making tons and tons of money. So, all right. Um, let me, we've got about eight minutes left. There's, there's a lot of questions here, so I'm probably going to skip around a bit so I can bring it to a nice close. Um, Do, do, do. Let's see. Okay, so Harry asks, how feasible do you think doing the PhD alongside other things is, for example, working, child care, et cetera? How much time do you need to put into it to keep making progress? There is no answer to that. I mean, uh, it depends on on what your what your work you're doing, what child care you're doing. You know, I finished my PhD um, while I had a young infant daughter. Um, then again, I was also at that point in time, um, pretty far along, you know, working on the dissertation. Uh, if I'd had you my prelims, we had tough prelims, not every place does. Uh, that might've been a real problem, right? Um, there isn't any, any simple answer to that other than to say that people do it and whether or not you can do it really depends on, how much it's going to take away from from your PhD work and what you're writing your PhD on and what you want it to look like, you know? So it, it doesn't automatically rule it out, but it is going to be tougher, right? Um, uh, Safarana says, I wanted to ask if you read any Islamic Muslim philosophers. Yes, I have. I'm not a specialist on it. So, and I don't read Arabic or any of the other languages that would be nice to, to have. So I leave that commenting on that sort of stuff to other people into a wide world out there. Um, let's see. Um, Isaac Zurich, do you think it's important to have some familiarity with Hegel before reading Kojev, or could one read the latter without having read the former? You can read things in any way you want to. I mean, you're not going to get most of what's being said in a philosophical text until you've reread it anyway. Um, I don't know why you want to read Kojev. You know, I mean, it does have some stuff that's not directly Hegel, but Kojev is a interpreter of Hegel, so 
why would you, you know, you read in Kojev, usually it's called, you know, his main book is Introduction to the Lecture of Hegel, right? Introduction to the Reading of Hegel. Um, you're getting a lot of Kojev in that case. He's easier to read than Hegel is, but um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think you have to like read one as prep for the other. Um, oh, this is a very interesting thing. Tyson says, do you have any tips on how to spark a love for reading? I used to love reading as a kid, but somehow lost it the minute I entered high school and haven't read much since. So it's sort of like, you know, losing the spark for other things, you know, like cooking or taking hikes or stuff like that. Maybe you make yourself do it, but you do it with things that you don't like put a lot of pressure on yourself. You read the kind of stuff you want to read and see if that will, you know, spark that, that love again. Um, you might also want to think about the things that could be like getting in the way. Like, are you watching too much streaming content rather than, than reading? You know, are you skimming around on websites, you know, um, and blogs rather than, and, 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 you know, all sorts of other things rather than reading books. Cause that can, that can take away from it. Or maybe, maybe something happened, you know, like maybe your teachers were crappy to you and, um, that's why you don't want to read. You gotta, I suppose you have to think through those sorts of things. Um, all right, let's see here. Do, do, do. Oh, <laughs> here's a blast from the past. Mr. Raiden, thoughts on The Walking Dead? Yeah, it was a series that started out with promise and quickly became unwatchable. Um, we used we used to watch it, and then after a while, we're like, "Come on, this, this is just not worth it," you know. Um, Gavin Ryan, you mentioned you teach business ethics. I'm wondering if you have any opinions on the ethics of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, yeah, well, here's here's thoughts. Business ethics and those are two different fields. Um, drawing on some common core stuff, but they're really two different areas. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, neither one of them is really living up to the name. Artificial intelligence is not intelligence. Machine learning is not anything remotely like learning. Um, we should look at these essentially as techniques and sets of tools and think about how we, how we want to make use of them um, without buying into any pie in the sky. This is going to fix everything sort of, sort of bullshit that it's pro their proponents are often throwing out. You know, tech people are, are often... Um, you know, either willfully self-deluded or just naively self-deluded about the capacities of, of technology. I often say, and this applies to both business ethics and what we could call tech ethics, that a large part of ethics is figuring out how to fix things after you've really screwed them up. And that is something that's sorely lacking in ethics of technology. Um, we, we, we should look at, you know, AI and machine learning and whatever other mythological things we want to put out there that have to do with computers and what we humans get them to do as not working most of the time and figuring out what to do after things have gotten screwed up, you know, um, planning for that sort of thing. BM, do you agree with Chomsky's designation of Lacan as a charlatan? No, I don't. And I think Chomsky was, was I think that's a stupid thing that, that Chomsky said and un, unbecoming of him. Um, I don't think that has to rule out, you know, either of these figures. But, um, yeah, I think, I think Chomsky didn't understand Lacan. Um, and going back to, like, the Searle Derrida, they're sort of like the same kind of thing. They didn't understand. The, the, the straight guy didn't understand the more complex thinker. Um, let's see. N one. It seems all our past music, art, philosophy, and literature has not been improved upon. Is there anything else to know? How would you possibly know that? I mean, there's so much music out there right now. How would you even know that? Like, just in pick one genre. You know, there's this really interesting thing happening called the new wave of traditional heavy metal where they're reinterpreting stuff like, you know, Dio. Um, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And we often forget how, many, how much crappy stuff there was back then that just hasn't survived, you know. Uh, but there's an epistemological question. How the hell would we know whether, like, contemporary art sucks compared to, you know, past art? 
you'd have to like you'd have to have, have superhuman capacities and like unlimited time to make those sorts of declarations, right? Um, all right. Do, do, do. Bozo, have you gotten into Land's work on Bitcoin much better than his collection of essays? I haven't. Um, you know, time is limited. Uh, somebody was kind enough to send me Fang Numina, so I've been reading my way through it. But I'm probably not going to spend time reading other stuff because I, I got other other stuff to do, right? Uh, oh, here's a good question. Was existentialism as big with the public in the 60s and 50s like new atheists were in the 2000s or Jordan Peterson in the late 2010s? So we're talking about certain select areas of the public um, because the new atheists and, and Jordan Peterson have never been like, you know, the whole culture is talking about them. Uh, but, but a sizable, you know, portion of, yeah, the existentialists were that big. Um, not all the existentialists mainly the ones who knew how to make a name for themselves. You know, Sartre and de Beauvoir were probably the best at that. Um, Gabriel Marcel is just as good as them, but got less airplay, you could say, and Lev Shestov got less than them, um, even though he was in Paris, uh, having fled the Russian Revolution. Um, yeah, I think you could say that. All right, let me see if I can find one other thing. Oh, wow, we're way, I'm over time, and I've got another thing to do before too long. Um, let's see here. Oh, here's, here's a good one to go out on as a curmudgeon. What are your thoughts on the philosophy and ethics certificate offered by Harvard University? People at Harvard are not any smarter than people anywhere else. Um, all they have is the name going for them. So if you want to do that sort of thing, because you want to do the sort of philosophical equivalent of what in, in the media and celebrity spirit sphere we call star fuckery, that go on ahead, you know? Um, but I wouldn't expect that it would be any better than content coming from anywhere else. And it might actually be worse because they're rather insular at places like, like Harvard, from my experience, you know? Um, I don't know anybody who would actually be impressed by you having such a certificate. But, you know, there's probably plenty of people out there for whom that, that could mean something. But I don't know. I'd have, I'd have to take a look at the program. And, you know, I don't know that it would be particularly um, helpful. So, all right. So I am going to bring this to a close. I uh, didn't get to everybody, but I got to at least the majority of the questions. We do these every month. Um, and uh, there's a whole playlist of previous ones that uh, other questions were asked, sometimes similar questions, but, um, and um, yeah, I got, got other stuff I gotta tackle today. Hope all of you have a good weekend. Um, those of you here in the United States, hope you have a safe 4th of July. Nobody gets their fingers blown off or rockets shot into their place or any silliness like that or drunk neighbors, you know, uh, causing fights or trouble like that. Everybody else hopefully has, has a good weekend as well.